we'll start with the um, oxidation states. So the the point of this um, of this problem is, and this is really the way that we use oxidation states on a regular basis, is um, to determine what type of reaction we had. Right, so because redox reactions behave differently and require different reactants and different conditions. Um, so knowing, just knowing how to classify a reaction, is it a redox react? And broadly speaking, those are the two categories. Um, Lex, you didn't have me for Gen Chem and Rob, it's been a while, but you know, when we first started classifying reactions, broadly speaking, those were our two categories. It's either redox or it's not. And I don't really have a good name for the type of reaction if it's not redox i've been called have been calling them complexation reactions because it's all you're doing is changing how things are arranged so you're, you're making a new complex of atoms but you're not changing what anything's electrons are doing so like proton transfer steps are are complexation precipitation reactions if you remember doing those um those uh KF values, those formation, complex ion formations um, in equilibrium reactions from 102. Um, those are like another case of it's not a re redox reaction. We're just rearranging how things are stuck together so, um, versus redox reactions where you're actually changing an oxidation state. So mentally for me, the, my, the way I think about them is that um, complexation reactions are like taking apart a Lego structure and building something else with it. They're all still the same Legos, just arranged differently. Um, but a redox reaction is like melting down those Legos and casting them into something totally new. They're not the same pieces anymore. You can't undo that. The, yeah, exactly. And, and we think about the way we determine whether or not it classifies. And technically, all of our complexation reactions are changing the electron density a little bit, because if you stick a proton onto a lone pair, now it's not a lone pair, now it's a bond, right, which changes the shape. So it really is semantics a little bit, but the way that we draw a hard line between those two cases is with oxidation states. If your oxidation states don't change, it's not a redox. So we'll start by reviewing doing oxidation states. And so for A, B, and C, is it ox is the molecule being oxidized, reduced, or neither? And typically also we're just talking about one carbon in particular saying this carbon is oxidized because mostly like for if we look at a um the methyl groups on either side on the acetone here they don't change none of the bonds changed we are only interested in the parts of the molecule that are changing so if we're looking at that carbon that carbon starts with two carbon-carbon bonds and it keeps the two carbon-carbon bonds, right? So those aren't changing. But if we wanted to, to just look at the oxidation state of that carbon, you've got a carbon double bonded to an oxygen, carbon to carbon. The, when you have the same atom on either side of a bond, when it comes to oxidation states, that counts as one electron because it's evenly split. If there's any difference in electronegativity, that's when we say that we just give the electrons to whatever is more electronegative. So here, those electrons all go with the oxygen. So this carbon, and then you get half of each of these. So that carbon only has two electrons in terms of oxidation states. So its oxidation state would be, we'd compare that to how many valence electrons it has on the periodic table, which is four. So it has two fewer electrons. So that makes it a plus two.
versus the same carbon on the product side, we still have the two carbon-carbon bonds, so nothing changed there. And we still have two bonds between carbon and something more electronegative. Right, so those chlorine electrons, carbon chlorine electrons go with the chlorines and entirely. So we still have plus two. So no change. It's not a read, it's not a redox reaction. about for B. It's oxidized, right? Our shortcut is if we added more bonds between a carbon and something more electronegative, usually oxygen, that's going to mean that carbon was oxidized. That's where the term oxidized comes from. Uh, if we wanted to count Electrons here we've got one plus two. So we've got three electrons on that carbon to begin with. So that would make it a plus one oxidation state. And here it's going to be a plus three oxidation state. And then the flip side, if we removed carbon oxygen bonds or carbon bonds to something more electronegative, replace them with anything, with hydrogens or with more carbon carbon bonds. Either case, you're giving more electrons to that carbon, right? So that's going to be a reduction. Out of curiosity, Lex, when you learned oxidation versus reduction, did you get any acronyms or like mnemonics? Leo says GER. Yeah, that's the one I, I default to. That's the one I learned in high school. There's also oil rig is the other one. Oxidation is loss. Reduction is gain. But Leo says GER is more colorful. Yeah. You also might remember back from Gen Chem having to learn about reducing agents and oxidizing agents and how annoying that was because it flipped things, right? If it's being oxidized, it was the reducing agent. But this is OCHEM is one of the reasons why we do that is because we don't, we've learned in OCHEM, we don't care much about the other reactants. We care about our carbon-based molecule. So we frame everything in terms of what does it do to our carbon-based molecule. So a reducing agent reduces our carbon-based molecule. Um, and so then typically what we're going to do with a, a reducing agent, this is another way to make alcohols. So we could make alcohols by doing addition reaction by oxidizing alkenes. We can also reduce carbonyls. So reducing carbonyls is basically taking a carbon oxygen pi bond. It's basically, you can, you can think of it um, a lot like um, an addition reaction, except you're adding a hydrogen to both sides. So it's like hydrogenation addition reaction, except that it's between a carbon and oxygen. Um, so if you start from a ketone or an aldehyde and you use a reducing agent, you can make an alcohol. And, and like I said, you're just going to break the pi bond and add a hydrogen to each side. Um, you can't make a tertiary alcohol that way, though. Why not? That's a thought. What would a tertiary... How could you do what a tertiary alcohol would look like? T-butyl alcohol, right? Well, 
what would the ketone look like that, that you would have to do to get that? Couldn't make it, it'd be by bonds, right? So you can't have a tertiary carbonyl, which means you can't make a tertiary alcohol this way. There's a way to do it, but it involves adding carbons and changing carbon structure. We'll talk about it in a minute. Okay, so in the most common reducing agents, we've seen them a little bit. Um, with the, you can just do straight hydrogenation like we did for alkenes. You take hydrogen and you use the right catalysts and the right catalysts are usually platinum, palladium, or sometimes nickel. Um, you can get decent, decent uh, results like this, um, but you have to be at like 400 atmospheres of hydrogen gas basically in really high temperatures at the same time. So it's just really, really nasty conditions. You have to be able to have a reaction vessel that can tolerate those kind of pressures. Um, so while that's a possibility, we don't. it's not that effective. And the other thing that's really weird about this is usually high pressures don't, or high temperatures don't favor addition reactions, right? high temperatures favor making more individual molecules because of the entropy. So we actually have to work against the entropy to do this and do it. And that's part of why we have to have such high pressures to do it. Um, so in general, we don't do that. We use um, stronger reducing agents. Hydrogen gas is a reducing agent, but it's not a particularly strong reducing agent. So we use a stronger reducing agent. Sodium borohydride is the, is the go-to because effectively what you do is you just start by um, adding a hydride. A hydride is a nucleophile um, because what's gonna happen when you if you have if you just think of it as a hydride not as sodium borohydride but it's the same same thing it's a little bit like hydronium versus just an h plus floating around um, if we have a hydride what part of the molecule is it going to be attracted to what's the mechanism going to look like here It would, it would be very attracted to a carbocation um, because what's happening then? Yeah, that if it was a full carbocation, then it would be a, a full charge, right? But even without that, if we have a partial positive anywhere, that's gonna be really, really attractive, but then we just need to make room So it looks a lot like our acid catalyzed um, hydration. Frankly, you start by breaking the pi bond and you're left with a negative charge right? in this case, as opposed to with our car with our um, acid catalyzed hydration, we broke this started by breaking the pi bond and we left the carbocation. In this case, we break the pi bond and we make a, an anion instead. So we just get an intermediate. It looks like this. We added a new hydrogen bond right here. And so now we just have a deprotonated alcohol, right? We have a cyclopentoxide ion. So it's the easiest way to turn that into an alcohol. Give it a proton source. Water. Right. So expose it to water and go back to this is why we we do this reaction in a protic solvent. Any protic solvent really will work. Um, we just wind up protonating after we break the pi bond. So we do the 
reduction step first and then a quick proton transfer step. Yeah, you have to have some proton source. You could do this in an aprotic solvent. You would just then need to add some acid. The solvent, though, the there would be. So we want to pick something that's a good proton source. I mean, although the, the concentrations, if we're doing, the solvent has such a high concentration relative to our concentration of our reactants usually that that won't usually be too much of a limitation. Um, especially if you use water, because water's molarity in itself is 55 moles per liter. Yeah. So there's a lot of water molecules around. But easier way, to, or the more, the way to drive it to completion and is to, typically what you do is you have, um, and we'll do this in lab, you have excess sodium borohydride, and then you add a little bit of some acid and if it has net effect of it uses up the leftover sodium borohydride and drives your equilibrium to the right at the same time. Right, and so this is exactly what we just looked at. There's your borohydride acting as a hydride source. Anytime you've got, like I said before, anytime you've got a hydrogen attached to something less electronegative, that makes your hydrogen a nucleophile. And these with carbonyls, when we get to a whole chapter on carbonyls, we'll see that pretty much always the first thing you do with carbonyls is something's going to attack that partial positive. Um, it's just a really convenient target for anything that's that has a negative charge. Like, um, I guess in these conditions. So, so yeah, so we can also have, it's, it's not as good of a target as an alkene bond because the oxygen doesn't like sharing its electrons. And so you would wind up, but you can do an, a, a more standard addition, a um, electrophilic addition, but it's not very common. We see a lot more nucleophilic additions for that reason. It's not a big thing. Yeah, exactly. Um, and again, so for the second step, whatever solvent you have floating around or whatever acid you have floating around, it's just a proton source. We only see this reaction though with ketones and aldehydes. It turns out carboxylic acids and acid derivatives don't get reduced this way. If you get carbon to a, so your our oxidation state here for a carbon um, is that's gonna be just a, it's a plus one here, right? Sorry, plus three. You get carbon all the way to a plus three oxidation state, you need a stronger reducing agent. You can't take a plus three carbon and reduce it using sodium borohydride. Um, and so there's a whole class of molecules that we call acid derivatives, are basically all of the functional groups where the carbon has a plus three oxidation state. So stuff like um, amides, acid chlorides, basically you mix up, it's a carbonyl, and then you change up what's attached, the other thing that's attached, but they're all more electronegative than carbon. If you put a chlorine there, if you put a nitrogen there, um, if you put an oxygen and then another R group to make an ester, um, none of those can be reduced with sodium borohydride. And those are all the class of molecules that we call acid derivatives because they all have that same oxidation state. So how do we reduce acids and acid derivatives? We get a stronger reducing agent. Turns out if you get something even nastier than sodium borohydride, we can reduce it. Um, and so the, and the go-to, the sort of nuclear option when it comes to reducing agents for OCHEM is lithium aluminum hydride. The D 
difference in electronegativity between aluminum and hydrogen is even greater than between boron and hydrogen. So you get more negative hydrides. Your hydrides are more reactive because they are taking on that full charge practically. Um, and there are probably some others, basically pretty much any metal hydride is gonna be able to act like this to some extent. Um, but for whatever reason, sodium borohydride and lithium aluminum hydride are the most common. They probably have a better shelf life. Sodium hydride would probably work, just NaH would probably work um, at least for the first reduction, maybe not for the four um, acid derivatives. Um, and one of the reasons it's, it is so reactive that you can't do this in a protic solvent. If you try to do this with a protic solvent, it reacts too strongly and you wind up with um, just making hydrogen gas and hydroxide. You wind up deprotonating your water and making hydrogen gas that way. Is it just the aluminum that's, um, that's reacting or is, is the lithium like stabilized it or does it participate? Yeah, the lithium is just there to balance the charge. Okay. Yeah. So it's the aluminum hydride. The uh, aluminum hydride makes a, a um, complex that just looks like a like a tetrahedral aluminum surrounded by hydrogens. And if you look at the formal charge on that aluminum, aluminum with four bonds is a minus one charge. So you wind up with this whole thing being minus one charge. So you need the lithium just to balance the charge. Same with so with the sodium borohydride. Stored up shelf. Exactly. We like things that, that are, we like salts, ionic compounds in general, because they're solids and they're relative. As long as you keep water away from them, they're pre pretty stable. Especially considering the main, besides water, like what's the number one thing that makes, that makes food go bad? is oxygen, right? Oxygen is a reducing agent. Um, oh, sorry, is that, that's wrong. Oxygen should be an oxidizing agent. So I guess oxygen, so letting it be exposed to oxygen would still be a big problem if you did it too much. Um, so they are gonna have a pretty finite shelf life, even if you do keep the, the water out. Uh, but it's in general, it's a lot better than having a liquid or a solution um, or a gas. Even the worst to try and store is a gas because you have to keep it in a cylinder, right? So the more we can avoid that, the better. Um, and lithium aluminum hydride, when it says it reacts violently with water, it means it catches on fire um, when you expose it to water. So we don't do that. One, we don't use lithium, lithium aluminum hydride if we can help it. It works better to use sodium borohydride for everything we can and only bring out the big guns when you need them. Um, and then you just make sure that your protonation is a separate step. You have to do the first step. The reduction has to be done in an aprotic solvent. Then you can introduce water or your proton source to, to do the second step. And in general, we don't see that big of a leap in terms of yields. The yields for sodium borohydride for an aldehyde, it's it's like 80%, maybe 70%. So the additional headache of having to deal with, with all the safety constraints and how expensive it is and how short the shelf life is for lithium aluminum hydride, avoid it whenever possible. So 70% yield. Um, these using sodium borohydride is is acceptable. Um, I think the shelf life of like we don't even have lithium aluminum hydride in the stock room because we don't use it often enough. It would go bad fast. We'd have to reorder it every year anyway. Um, but sodium borohydride's got a shelf life that's a couple years long, um, especially if you keep it sealed most of the time. So winds up being a much better option. 
it also gives us some control over what happens if we have multiple functional groups. So for instance, if we, if we used hydrogen gas and platinum on this molecule to hydrogenate it to reduce the carbonyl, we're gonna wind up reducing everything. We're gonna wind up with um, that hydrogenation happening to the alkene and to the carbonyl. Plus we have to do it that super high pressures and temperatures. Um, if we want to hydrogenate one part of the molecule, but not another, if we did, if we did this reaction, but at lower temperatures, then in lower pressures, we could hydrogenate just the alkene and leave the carbonyl alone. Or we could uh, reduce just the carbonyl and leave the alkene alone if we use these hydride sources. Hydride sources won't react with an alkene uh, because they need to they need to have a target to attack, right? They need to have a pretty strong partial positive, have something it can attach to. Now, we do have to watch out for the hydroboration side of things, but that's sodium borohydride is not the same reactant as borane. Just as an example molecule. Yeah. Just because we always do pentagons and hexagons. Uh, and if you want a good practice, like I always say, try drawing a, a seven, a regular heptagon. Um, it's just good practice. I always draw the half of an octagon and then half of a hexagon and then connect the sides, um, which gets you close enough to a regular heptagon. That looks like the bottom part of half of the stop sign, and that looks like the top half of a hexagon, and then you just connect them. And lithium aluminum hydride can reduce acid derivatives too. Haven't seen this meme recently, but I have it saved. Um, carboxylic acids won't be reduced by sodium borohydride, but you bring out the big guns and you do wind up with them getting reduced. It's like, I, I keep making the point, it's really nasty. Um, so there are some, some of the example problems and stuff where we'll use lithium aluminum hydride where we don't strictly speaking need to because it's just on paper. We would never do that in the lab though. So what do we get for, for A? Why don't we reduce? You can practice by drawing the mechanism as well. So we're gonna get the alcohol. So we're going to wind up with that oxygen being, or that carbon being reduced. So we're going to get a primary alcohol here a primary alkoxide ion first, and then step two is just that proton transfer. Final product, just look like that. That result's really simple. You take a carbonyl, you turn it to an alcohol.
something different about it when we when we start with a ketone instead of an aldehyde. Just be at a secondary alcohol instead of a primary one. Other than that, it's the same thing, right? It's not always trick questions. Okay. Sometimes it really is that simple. If it's an acid derivative, We wind up with um, a couple of things happen. The only, I guess really the only difference really is that with an acid derivative, um, whatever, whatever your other part of the molecule is, the other part of the functional group, is a decent leaving group as it is. And so you wind up reducing that carbon twice. So you wind up, so for B, you'd wind up with a, an intermediate that looks like like this, where we've added a new A new hydrogen that, that we added, I'll draw in blue here. If we have a strong enough reducing agent, though, it'll continue and reduce that as well. And so you wind up just with your OH group or whatever that is leaving. Um, and you wind up turning this into just a primary alcohol. You don't get the diol. We get two new carbon hydrogen bonds. And then when we hydride or then when we protonate it, We're just going to get those are new two new carbon hydrogen bonds, and then the proton transfer step at the end, you just put in a H plus attached to the alkoxide ion. If it's something more complicated than a um, than that, you wind up making the your lead, when your leaving group leaves, you don't just get a hydroxide, you would get a so for C, you would get an alkoxide uh, as well. So you would actually get. methanol as well. If that was, if that leaving group was something like a chloride or something like a nitrogen, same thing. You just break it off and you're gonna get the other part of that molecule is just floating around as now an amine or a chloride on its own. So all of these, did I lose? No, I just erased one. 
Uh, so A and B, you're going to get the same product. You're going to have one butanol in both cases. doesn't matter if you start as the aldehyde or if you start as, as butanoic acid. You're going to get the same molecule. C just has one fewer carbon. Um, so you can get the one propanol instead. So here's the after your first, it actually does it does look like it doesn't stay as a negative charge. You wind up remaking that carbonyl bond when you kick off the good leaving group. But then once you do that, you still have another good target for reduction again. So regardless of what that leaving group is, first step is you, you go from the acid derivative to, a, it's always going to be an aldehyde in this case, right? Because you can't have one of these acid derivatives in the middle of a carbon chain because it takes up three of a carbon's four bonds, right? So after the first reduction step, you always wind up with an aldehyde and whatever your leaving group was has now left. And then you take the aldehyde and you reduce it again. Follow up with proton transfer to finish things up. For whatever reason, um, OCHEM students like to make memes about lithium aluminum hydride. I like this one better than the Thor one, even. It's and that's why it's such a nasty reagent because you expose it to anything, and it's going to react somehow and often violently. Um, it's one of the few ionic compounds that actually get stored in the flammable cabinet. For the most part, ionic compounds, they might be reactive, but they're not considered flammable. The exception is things like lithium aluminum hydride. And then we also keep the sodium metal and the potassium metal are in the flammable cabinet as well. Um, it's not that the aluminum is more reactive, it's that the hydride is more reactive because aluminum oxide is totally non-reactive and aluminum hydroxide even is non-reactive. But the fact that you've got a hydride attached to the aluminum and the aluminum is so, its electronegativity is so low that the hydride gets to leave really easily. It makes it, it's, if you think about it in terms of, um, like you would think about how strong an acid is, how strong an acid is, is determined by how stable the product is, right? Um, in this case, how this is a really good hydride source, not a proton source, because your leaving group can leave really easily. And then you just get aluminum, which is pretty, pretty mild. And it's going to find if there's uh, proton sources around you, it's just going to wind up forming bonds with the uh, oxygen in those proton sources usually. So you'll make some small amount of aluminum hydroxide or aluminum oxide as a, as a byproduct here. It, yeah. An aluminum oxygen bond is a lot more stable because oxygen is a lot more stable with a negative charge, having all those electrons. Hydrogen with a negative charge is really unstable. All right. So we, we talked about the two reduction steps. Let's take our break now. Let's come back at, at 11. Um, I'll run over and grab those tests so you can take a look at those tests when we get started. Um, and then we just have a little bit more. We'll
looking like we'll probably be even done a little bit early today. We're kind of we're moving pretty. It's actually that we covered so much material on Tuesday um, allows us to get through this lecture, this material a little bit faster because I don't have any notes for you on your tests. This is one that home when I had like more time. I was like, why did I? I need to add an extra methyl group. I like well, I lost track of the carbon. Yeah. <laughs> Once I added the alkyne, I like just dis disappeared in my mind. <laughs> like I just dropped the carbon. Right. That's, you know, it's all kinds. It's really easy to to lose a carbon because you forget that there's two of them there because yeah. you draw them as a straight line. Yeah. It's like when I was adding it together and I was doing it last night, I made that same mistake again. I'm like, oh wait, now I see. Like, yeah. yeah. Through the year, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, I guess like under all the trees, yeah, just like yeah, flopping like it's like first of the night, it's like ball ball, it's like dropping on our roof, you know, the trees. It's, it's like, it's like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think some guy, uh, I guess I'm this guy, but like I haven't seen him around town at all. Uh, he was like in our little like, neighborhood, like trying on corners. My next door neighbor was home and he like tried to open the door. Wow. And he just had like, oops, the side. Like, so like, yeah. yeah. I'll take his picture, you know, like oh, just God. in case someone gets robbed and you're like, well, there's a suspect. Like, <laughs> Seven, like none of them are number seven. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I think it's the casino because it like draws a certain type of area. But it's like the opposite of the Yeah. Okay. Or Temple Bay. Oh, that's right. There's like nothing in the casino. It's like a little outside. I have to live here and it looks like they fly into a whole drug bust in this neighborhood. I'm like, that's a good question. Like, <laughs> I guess you just have to play there or something. So you teach more on. Um... No, it's between like the keys and like each. Oh, yeah. Okay, so it's like so. It's. It's like a, it's a little nicer than Reagan, you know, but you like have to park by all the like rich houses and so walk by there. Yeah. 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 They like make it off limits like certain years during the summer to dogs, though, because um, all the rich people like couldn't. They couldn't like block people from going back there legally because it's like federal land. So they like hired a bunch of biologists. They're like, is there anything endangered back there that we can like use as an like, excuse to keep like people and dogs away? And they're like, yeah, I guess birds like <laughs> eat us in here. So but, yeah, they got dogs banned for like. Someday I'm going to have to run. Yeah, I'm tired of like a bunch of realtors and stuff. Like that.
exciting news. Got some pictures of the new labs. Um, there, I think it's going to look pretty good. I'm going to throw them up on the screen here as soon as I can get it loaded. Um, they're here. So, yeah, it's the chem lab will be in the same place it was, which doesn't help you necessarily. Um, like but cool there, yeah, you, there's that staircase that you can go up to get to the second floor. Um, like when you're walking towards the breezeway, you can cut over into that little shadowy area. There's there's a staircase right there that you can get to the second the classrooms on the second floor. Um, if you go past the staircase on that bottom floor, is going to be the um, a big open area for science students to hang out near the labs and work. We're going to keep that made a big deal of keeping the science commons is what we call it. Yeah, it's yeah. whiteboard and a bunch of tables where you, so that way you don't have to be sitting in lab to be working on the paper parts of your labs. Um, and then if you go go past that, you can actually see it from back from back over here um, is where the, the chemistry lab is. Um, and so will you be able to connect through there to come over this way? Or? Yeah, we'll probably go out the same door we used to. Um, or but yeah, so that that plywood door that's at the end over there. Oh. If we're if we're in this classroom, we were walking the lab, we would stay in the building. Oh yeah. I feel bad for the IT guys to see like out there with their computers and the store just like reeling it back. Yeah, that's that is something we will be able to avoid. It's still going to look like a chemistry lab. All new cupboards. All new, all new countertops. They'll be gray instead of black, but the same material. Uh, that's just where we're arguing about where ventilation stuff is going to go. Or What's that? Other hoods new? Yeah, brand new hoods, brand new flooring, brand new um, electrical. They'll we'll actually have like outlets that work. And gas fixtures that work. Um, Would you like a vacuum line too? Or? I don't remember what we decided for the vacuum line. We talked about a vacuum line. I think we went with it makes more sense to just have the small vacuum pumps because having a vacuum line means you have to have an entire room like the size of it's basically actually you need a vacuum pump that's the size of that that footprint of the linoleum over there. Um, and then you have to pay to maintain it. Um, so I think we decided like, no, we'll, we'll just buy a couple more. If we have, if we have a half dozen of those vacuum pumps, that's going to be just as functional for a fraction of the cost. And then we can replace them if we need to, yeah. uh, but we will have gas lines. We will have, um, water everywhere and everything. So it'll be, it'll be a fully functional, real chemistry lab. We we had to hang in there for a long time. We had um, almost you know a third of our of our benches. The lab bench was totally inoperable because it, the gas line had to be shut off to it because there was a leak somewhere in there and they couldn't find it and fix it. The electrical didn't work because there was a blown fuse somewhere and they couldn't find it and fix it. 
So it's like it was flat space. It was counter space, but you couldn't use it if we needed if you needed to plug anything in or if you needed to use a Bunsen burner. So, and we were like that for like two years because we're like what well, the the RFE is coming, the renovations coming. Like we don't really want to sink a whole bunch of money into fixing this just to tear it out. So it'll be really nice to be in a real lab that works again because it's probably been this is it twenty twenty four. It's probably been eight years since I've been in a lab where everything worked. <laughs> Clearly, I'm pretty excited about that. Okay, um, what is it set to be over? We're still set to move in um, over spring break. So we'll be in there. We'll be schedule. When you register for 03, we'll be in lab in there. We're probably still moving in for part of that. So there'll be a little bit of living out boxes aspect. We'll unpack as we do a lab and then put it away in the right spot. Um, but uh, but you'll get to be the first group that, that's in there. Um, so that's kind of fun. All right. Let's talk a little bit about um, how we can make a tertiary alcohol. And we mentioned this before. I brought up green yard reagents as a way to modify the um, carbon structure, we kind of just touched on them and then went back to using um, the alkynes as nucleophiles. This is a is a lot more flexible of a way to do it, um, but you also need the right reagents to start with, and the yields tend to be lower. Um, and so that's what that's those Grignard reagents. Grignard reagents are if you take an alkyl halide. If you expose it to magnesium metal, which in magnesium metal is really, really common, and alkyl halides are really, really common because they're so useful for synthesis. So all you have to do is take an alkyl halide, expose it to magnesium metal, and you make a magnesium bromide with an R group attached to it. Um, and this, this first one on the top left, bromobenzene, being converted to a Grignard reagent, uh, we will actually do that one in, if not this quarter, the next quarter. Um, it's tricky because the first, because making the Grignard reagent is pretty much a whole lab in and of itself. Um, and it has, you have to be really, really careful not to have any oxygen around, uh, or sorry, any uh, water around, because the oxygen in the water winds up reacting with the magnesium more strongly than the alkyl halide will. So if you try and do that, you're just going to make magnesium oxide and be left with your alkyl halide. Uh, but if we can keep the water out of the system, we can make this Grignard reagent that is has a shelf life that's measured in the days. Um, so it's not something you could make and then seal it up really well and leave it on the shelf because it will react just with the oxygen in there. There's probably a way you can do it, but it's unstable enough that you can't even really buy Grignard reagents. Um, you'd have to probably you know do something like do the reaction under an inert atmosphere. So just with pure nitrogen or argon as your as your atmosphere um, and keep it sealed with no water. And then when you sealed it, you would have to seal it well enough that you got an airtight, more or less permanent seal, which generally means melting glass. If you melt glass and seal it, um, then you can get something, then it would be stable enough that you could keep it around. Uh, but that's not something that you could would really ship or anything. So typically, Grignard reagents are made on site because the, react the reactants are really stable and easy to come by. So you just make it yourself and then use it, which is why we get into, we try and do it in two successive labs a week apart though. Yeah. And so there's always the risk that it did, didn't actually get well sealed um, and it kind of went bad. We got some results the second week when we did this last time, um, but they weren't great results. Um, but there was, what we get out of this, the Grignard reagent itself, all of a sudden, just like having a hydride source where you've got hydrogen attached to a metal or something less electronegative, we have carbon attached to something less electronegative than it is, that carbon becomes a nucleophile. So just like the hydrides, 
this allows us to add an R group anywhere we want. So all you have to do is have a good target, either a good leaving group, because you can actually do SN2 reactions with these. Um, but more relevant to what we're talking about is you can reduce carbonyls, especially aldehydes and ketones. Aldehydes and ketones um, have a strong enough partial positive and they're reactive enough that you can have this R group come in and attach just like it's the same mechanism that the hydride reduction does. Come in with a negative on, in this case, a negatively charged carbon and attach it to the partial positive carbon, which breaks the pi bond. And then you just need a proton source after the fact to protonate that oxygen and you wind up making an alcohol. More importantly, we wind up changing the carbon structure in a really controllable and predictable way. So this is probably the, the single easiest way to modify the carbon skeleton when it comes to synthesis questions. Problem is the yields aren't great. Um, so if there are other ways to do it, that's um, going to get you better results. Which is why we tend to not to introduce this one until we get to this chapter. Um, so, but this is also one way that we can make a tertiary alcohol as well. We couldn't make a tertiary alcohol by doing a hydride reduction, but if you if you start from a ketone and you add an R group to that carbonyl carbon, and then you just have a proton source, like I mentioned. So it's pretty straightforward. Like I said, the same mechanism, just starting from a different reactant, starting from a Grignard reagent instead of starting from an, a hydride source. Questions so far? It's definitely one of those where it's there's so many possibilities that it can wind up feeling a little paralyzing, a little decision paralysis. Um, so just just remember to make a Grignard reagent, all you need, you need to have an, an alkyl halide. So if you can either pull an alkyl halide out of the stock room, or if you can make an alkyl halide, like making that bromotoluene from the synthesis question, you could take bromotoluene and expose it to magnesium and make yourself a Grignard reagent like that and add a carbon followed by a benzene ring to anything you wanted. And so there are lots of ways, if you can add a bromine somewhere where you want it, then you can turn that into a nucleophile. Um, so it's, it's exceptionally powerful in terms of its flexibility. Um, if you can, you can do this twice even. If you have your, and you can react in a, an acid derivative here. Um, if you have excess, so this we name this would be methyl magnesium bromide. Um, we don't really worry too much about the, the IUPAC names for the Grignard reagents. Um, if you have excess methyl magnesium bromide, and you can actually add a methyl group twice if you start it from an acid derivative. So they are strong enough to reduce acid derivatives as well, just like lithium aluminum hydride, and not great results. Um, and it, it would get tricky if you wanted to add two different R groups. You would have to rely on the stoichiometry to do that. Um, make sure that you had just enough methyl magnesium bromide to react once and you'd wind up making the a ketone. And then you could come in with a different R group with ethyl magnesium bromide and add an ethyl group to the same spot to make the alcohol. Um, but it's, again, yields are going to be pretty low. Um, it's, this is really where we start getting into the idea that in chemistry and in physics, we can make anything happen if we're willing to sink enough money into it and deal with low enough yields. Can't do it economically, which keeps, keeps certain medications being more expensive than others. And we'll get into the economics of that as well. Uh, but yeah, if you're willing to deal with you know single digit yields and just throw money at it, you can make anything you want. And research labs do that. 
it's the chemical and the biological engineering that then have to come take that and say, okay, well, can we refine the synthesis pathway, get our yields up somehow to make it economically viable? Um, I, I was just thinking about when I was teaching the, the high school kids about um, nuclear reactions and how like, yeah, we can turn lead into gold these days. We've actually, we've accomplished what the ancient alchemists were trying to do. Problem is we have to dump so much money into it, so much energy into doing a fission reaction um, with lead and to, but it's doable, but why? It's just so much easier to just mine the gold or recycle it or pull it out of a landfill than it is to, heck, it's probably cheaper to go find an asteroid and mine an asteroid than it is to make a measurable amount of gold using a particle accelerator at this point. So um, this is definitely one where we're going to be like, okay, yeah, we can do it. Is this the best way? Or is this your reagents are sort of the brute for a force approach. Can't find any other way to make a molecule. You can always use a Grignard reagent. You're just, there might be a better way. And so here's the mechanism for if it's, if we're looking at, producing a um, uh, acid derivative, start by reducing, you make, you break that carbonyl pi bond, but then your leaving group leaves and you remake the carbonyl pi bond because that's more stable than having the good leaving group and leaving it with a negative charge on the oxygen. So you kick the leaving group off, remake, and so you go from an ester Using this approach, you would go from an ester to a um, ketone, and then from a ketone to a tertiary alcohol. And again, control is tricky. You typically just see the same R group added twice. You could try to do it with two different R groups, but it's gonna get really, really low yields. And uh, it, you can get decent yields if you just use excess of your Grignard region, do the same thing twice, because you can rely on on um, equilibrium, and then you only have to purify it once as well at the end. Um, but again, same mechanism. So when we did this with a hydride source, we won't always wound up with an aldehyde, um, followed by a primary alcohol. We do this with a Grignard reagent, we always get a ketone that then turns into a tertiary alcohol. So finding some way to do this to split the difference is tricky. You want to take an acid derivative and turn it into a secondary alcohol. You have to do something like Grignard reagent first, followed by sodium borohydride. It's going to be around still as as methoxide. When you when you go back and you add the proton source later, you'll make some methanol as your as your as side product, but it doesn't really interfere too much. It's a decent nucleophile, but it's not as good a nucleophile as a hydride or as a Grignard reagent. Uh, what we probably would do is so to make sure we only have one byproduct. That could possibly interfere because you're right. It will be a there will be an equilibrium there, right? Because the methoxide can act as a nucleophile and undo this a little bit or interfere. Um, if we do this, if your leaving group is a methoxy group, we want to make sure we use methanol as our proton source because then it's the same molecule as the proton source. If we used water, then we have hydroxide and methoxide floating around. We have now we have more things happening. But if we if we use methanol as our proton source, whatever our leaving group is as our proton source, that's going to make sure that we kind of minimize those other things that could happen. So how could we use a Grignard reagent to make this molecule? If we, let's say we started from butanone, there's actually several ways we can do this. Um, the 
depending on what our starting material is. There's we do a one step. We're not going to start from an acid derivative. What are the possible molecules we could start from? And the green yard reagents that would go with them. We have three R groups attached to the, that carbon, right? So if we say R1 is a benzene ring, R2 is a methyl group, R3 is an ethyl group. So there are three separate reactions we could use. We're going to do a one step Grignard reagent. What would they be? One of them be. Remember, Grignard reagent adds an R group to something that was already there that reduces a ketone. So if we started with the ketone, that ketone could start with R2 and R3 already attached, right? And then we could say R1 as a magnesium bromide. And the reason I'm using these R groups is not just to save space when it comes to defining this, but just to see that they're, to try and show you that they're interchangeable, right? Any of the three R groups could be our Grignard reagent, as long as the other two are already attached. And so we could start with, if R1 is our Grignard reagent, then the reaction is going to be Plus a ketone that has a methyl group on one side and an ethyl group the other side. All right, so that looks like butanone if we actually draw that out skeletal structure. That'd be butanone. So that would give us our desired product. If we started with benzene ring and the methyl group attached, then we would just need to have the ethyl group as our Grignard reagent. So what would the third possibility be, the third combination? Yeah, we have the methyl Grignard reagent. So this is another example of why these, this Grignard reagent is so flexible. You go in the stock room and you look at what you have that's a bromide and what do you have that's already a ketone. I guarantee you we have butanone in there, and I know we have bro we have bromo or uh, bromo benzene. So I know we have the reagents just sitting in the stock room to do it the first way. That's strong. We pro I probably have ethyl bromide, and I bet we have that ketone. I don't remember what that ketone is called off the top of my head. It's got a common name. Um, 
And I bet we have that ketone and the ethyl bromide. I doubt we have the methyl bromide. We have methyl iodide, which might work, but we'd want to do some more research. And I don't know if we would have that ketone. So it's, but it gives us the possibility of go see what we have. I think because it gives us three options, depending on what we make the R group and what we make the existing molecule. So writing it out the other way, it would be the ethyl. At the methyl. Magnesium bromide. And ethyl group. I abandoned my color coding. If we wanted to start from a carboxylic acid derivative, we could start from benzoic acid. If we could do methyl magnesium bromide followed by ethyl magnesium bromide, we could do it twice. Again, just going to have low yields. So that gives us even more flexibility because we really can break it all of our three R groups apart, as long as one of them starts as a carbonyl compound, and we have the other two as bromides or iodides or, or uh, chlorides. Oh, there you go. Nice and neat. You could have the phenyl and the ethyl attached and add the methyl. You could have the phenyl and the methyl, and add the ethyl. You could have the methyl and the ethyl and add the phenyl. Um, I don't I haven't used this as an abbreviation too much, but that's the, just like methyl and ethyl have their own abbreviation, a benzene ring is abbreviated as a pH um, or occasionally like that. So if you, you could see, Um, that zero with a cross, or I think they actually use a Greek letter usually. You only, I only really ever see that. That's really old school, and I only really see it on um, things that are um, handwritten. So just to indicate you have that cyclic pi structure, um, that's how you show a benzene ring sometimes. But pH is more universal. It works and it's cheap. You find it everywhere. Um, they're almost guaranteed there's other met metals you could use. Um, there is a whole chapter on organometallic chemistry. But pretty much always, when you put a carbon and attach it to a metal, you're going to get a nucleophile out of it. Um, if you happen to pick a metal that is a little bit more, more electronegative, closer to carbon's electronegativity, you can get a more stable covalent bond which is kind of what happens with um, with things like iron in hemoglobin. Those are true covalent bonds. Those are actually those are actually more like um, those complexation reactions, one of those complex ions. We get a bunch of lone pairs and surround a metal ion. It kind of holds it in place. Um, but there's there are other options, but you know, magnesium has would wager that magnesium is a, it's a balancing act between what's um, cheapest with good enough yields. If you change that magnesium, you're almost all, almost certainly going to be making something that's more expensive and you're probably gonna drop the yields as well. That is definitely something that, that, that the chemical engineers would look at. Like, okay, we did a proof of concept with magnesium if we use zinc instead of magnesium, does that up our yields? Because zinc's almost as cheap as magnesium. Um, probably anything with a plus two charge react, react pretty similarly. You don't want to hit that fine line between making something stable enough we can use it in the synthesis for the next step, and but we don't want it to be too stable where the next step gets too hard.
right? Because if it if it's really hard to break your your carbon off of the metal, that's as bad as not being able to make it in the first place, right? By effectively making it irreversible reaction. That was something that was really weird to me when I took biochem. Upper division biochem, they talk a lot about binding affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen. Um, it turns out that if, if oxygen binds too well to hemoglobin, that seems like a positive thing, right? Good binding affinity. It's really, it really holds onto the oxygen tightly. Well, if it holds onto the oxygen too tightly, then it doesn't let go of it when it gets to your limbs. Um, and so that's, you know, there's that fine line there as well. We want it to make a stable compound, but not too stable of a compound. All right. This is the last slide. And we can either work our way through these and do some different questions for the quiz, or we could make these the quiz questions. Um, you want a chance to work through these on your own. I think feeling comfortable enough with this that we could do that. The same thing we just did from the last one with these. I'll probably put one more question on about some of the, uh, the other alcohol properties that we talked about on Tuesday. This would be happening. Except for C, no, it doesn't have to be a Grignard reaction. So I'm going to turn off the, the recording. So we won't go through these ones today.